Hello everybody, this is David Panush of the Edmund Burke School, and this is a video lecture introducing the, some of the main concepts in evolutionary psychology. And the way this is going to work is um, we'll break it up into three or four parts, and each part is going to explain a part of this uh, mind map. And so I'll try to look up and look down because i got to manipulate the thing. Um, and if you have questions, as always, please come and see me or get in touch with me so I can answer them. Let's begin with the idea of evolutionary psychology. So just as a beginning point, evolutionary psychology is just a way of explaining human behavior by taking into account the evolved psychology that we have. So our brain evolved over thousands and thousands of years, and we should take into account how it evolved when we try to explain human behavior. So let's look at how human evolutionary psychology tries to explain human behavior, like what the model is. So let's begin with an individual's genes. So we're going to talk in another lecture about where this stuff comes from, but each individual does have what we're going to call in this class and what Robert Wright calls in his book, the knobs of human nature. And the knobs of human nature are sort of our universally evolved psychological mechanisms or tools. Um, and each of us has these knobs, if you will. Now they're set differently. So not everybody has the same setting by genetic predisposition as everyone else. That everyone knows that I may feel, um, you know, happier more easily than someone else, or I may feel sad more easily than somebody else. So you know there's variation, but the fact is we both have the capacity to feel happy or sad. So the first thing that might explain my behavior is what are my individual settings? The next thing that might explain my behavior is what are the individual experiences that I have had over the course of my life? So even if I'm a twin, from the moment of my birth, I have different experiences, maybe even before my birth in the womb, different experiences than my twin. So even if we share the same genetic composition, which twins do, it's going to end up being shaped by our experiences. And we know enough about genetics these days um, that, that we know that, that genes can be turned on or turned off or regulated by the environment and the experiences that we have. So we know that the, these, are, this, these would be the settings on the knobs of human nature, partly how they are set. So whatever our experiences are, both as children and as adults, but, but largely our formative experiences are going to affect how we might behave. Thirdly, the role of culture. And we know that culture plays a huge role, again, interacting with our genes, right, in shaping how the knobs are set. So this is largely going to be through our familial influences. How are we brought up? Um, how are we raised? What are the laws of the state or country uh, where we live? Um, when we get educated, what are they teaching us uh, about how to act or how to believe? Um, religion, similar, right? What are we told about how the world should work, what you should be doing? Um, and finally, media in all of its myriad ways is shaping how we think and feel and act as well. And all of this, again, is interacting with what we've evolved to have. Next would be context. So even with all of our predispositions, even if you say that they're kind of like baked in, how we were raised, what society we grew up in, what our genes are, um, the fourth thing is in a particular context, we act differently. And so we can never discount context. It's a very strong influence on what we may do in any particular situation. And there's a whole branch of psychology focused just on that. Usually, you know, the context, um, that's where social psychology tends to focus. Well, assuming we have all of that in place, what causes action? And, and largely, it's actually emotions. And this is where there is that tie to our evolution, because we feel the emotions subconsciously, often before we act. So whatever situation we're in, I might feel a certain way, not even putting a name on that emotion and, and, and or face on that emotion, but my brain begins to experience it, the, the neurotransmitters, um, are released, the neurons are firing below the level of consciousness because when you think about the brain, right, like that, that prefrontal cortex is the last thing that evolved. Those emotional centers, they came earlier. So 
our emotions start triggering before our prefrontal cortex, which is where our awareness is, even knows it's happening. So we're feeling our emotions, we've got all these things, and because of our emotions, then we have an action and a behavior. And quite often, we might do the behavior without realizing the role of the emotions or without realizing the role of context, or without realizing the role of culture or individual experiences or individual genetics, right? So we go through life quite often completely unaware of why we are doing things and why other people are doing things. And we, when we want to understand, we might have to look at all of these things, which is not easy, right? Like human behavior is messy. It's not a simple explanation. Oh, people um, get jealous because they see, you know, somebody with somebody they love. Well, yes, but what is your upbringing about jealousy? What does your culture tell you about jealousy? In this context, you know that it's not romantic, so you're not jealous or not emotional, you know, so you're not jealous. But maybe even all that rationality doesn't matter because you feel jealous. Like that's just your feeling. And maybe you're somebody whose knob is set really high. What actions does it lead to? Do you, are you passive aggressive? Are you aggressive aggressive? Um, or do you just like, you know, seethe, you know, under the surface and let it blow some other time? So all those are possibilities and they all fit together. So that's the model that we're going to be working with for the first six weeks of the course. When we try to explain human behavior. Um, that's the conceptual framework. And a few things before we move on, which I think is important. We talk about explaining human behavior using evolutionary psychology. We have to be careful. When we say humans are hardwired or genetically evolved to feel jealous, right? When they see someone they love, maybe interacting with another person like as a threat, okay? That may be the case, that, that, that on average, that's the way a lot of people feel. And there could be good evolutionary reasons for that, but that doesn't make it moral. It doesn't make it the right thing to do. It also doesn't make it the wrong thing to do. It doesn't make it good or bad, but it is, if we think that's true, it's something we have to account for. But we, we need to be careful not to confuse whatever that evolutionary, um, you know, reaction might be with the right reaction or the good reaction or the just reaction, right? We have, that's why we have culture and context and society and all these things telling us maybe to, to do something different than what our, our emotions might be telling us. The other important aspect of that is that it's not set in stone. So, you know, just because we've evolved to be a certain way, or even you have a certain predisposition, doesn't mean that you can't change it right? Doesn't mean that you can't make a different decision um, or grow over time to behave differently. So just because we have evolved a certain type of psychology, you as an individual or we as a species, doesn't mean it's right or wrong. And it doesn't mean that it's unchanging for you or as a species to some degree. Um, so that's, that's where we're going to begin with evolutionary psychology, how it explains human behavior, what the model is, and what it is uh, is and is not in terms of, of morality and destiny.